requested it. I did a poll. And survey says, ding. Y'all got it. All right. Let's get on this. Now, just so you know, it's, um, I could only find a full version on Twitter. Like one person posted it from what I, at least when I searched it, but also CNN posted in parts. So I had actually already made a compilation of all those parts and they seem to be around the same length. Mine actually may be a little longer. It's a joke there. I'm going to leave it alone. So I'm going to use this one. Maybe it'll have a little bit more info in it. So let's, let's do this. And welcome. We are live from Chester Township, Pennsylvania, Delaware County, one of the critical counties around Philadelphia that will help determine who wins the White House. Welcome to CNN's president. Chester Town. When I was little, uh, they used to have a term. They would call you a Chester if you tried to talk to certain individuals. Chester the fill it in. Yeah. So whenever I hear Chester, that I automatically think that. Town Hall with the Democratic nominee, Vice President Kamala Harris. I'm Anderson Cooper. Now, in this room, we have assembled a group of 32 Pennsylvania voters who say they are still undecided or persuadable. All of them are registered to vote. Some cast votes for Joe Biden in 2020, others okay. for Donald Trump. Some didn't vote at all. And okay. for some, this is their first election. Many are leaning right now to one candidate or another, but they all say they have yet to make their final choice. The Silver Fox. Now, we found these voters working with a nonpartisan research firm, as well as business and religious groups, universities, and other civic organizations. These voters are asking their own questions tonight, selected by CNN to cover a variety of topics. You may see them holding a piece of paper when they're asking their question. It has their question on it. That is a question they have come up with. It has not been edited in any way by CNN. We also invited former President Donald Trump to participate in a town hall or a debate. He declined. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Vice President Kamala Harris. <laughs> you see that face she made before she stepped out? Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Vice President Kamala Harris. Looked like she didn't know where she was going. <laughs> Thank you. Hey. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, so much. everyone. Good evening. Thanks so much for being with us. We're going to get to the uh, the audience in just a second. I want to start by asking you though: for weeks, you have been calling Donald Trump unstable, unhinged. You've called him dangerous. You've quoted General Milley recently, who called him a fascist. Today, you quoted General Kelly, who said that Trump repeatedly praised Hitler. Yeah. But there are tens of millions of Americans right now who have heard all those things and they don't buy it. Or even if they do, they're still going to vote for Donald Trump. He's arguably don't more buy popular it. now than ever. You have 13 days to go. What do you say to those voters to convince them? Because some of them are in this room. Friday the 13th. Very unlucky. Very unlucky number for Kamala. Sure. And I, I thank you all for taking the time to be here. And you could be doing a number of other things with your time. So this really is proof that we love our country. People are engaged, Anderson, and really want to talk about the issues. And so the issue that you raise, yes, I do believe that Donald Trump is unstable, increasingly unstable, and unfit to serve. And I don't necessarily think that everyone has heard what you and I have heard repeatedly which is no, we the people who know Donald Trump best, the people who worked with him in the White House, in the Situation Room, in the Oval Office, all Republicans, by the way, who served in his administration, his former chief of staff, his national security advisor, former secretaries of defense, and his vice president. Her whole campaign is Trump bad, Trump evil, Trump Hitler, isn't it? have all called him unfit and dangerous. They have said explicitly he has- By the way, I did ask you guys to send me clips of her saying that she would keep us out of a new war, that she would try to stop wars, and I still haven't gotten any links sent to me. Contempt for the Constitution of the United States. 
They have said he should never again serve as president of the United States. We know that is why Mike Pence is not running with him again, why the job was empty. And then today we learned that John Kelly, mm. a four-star Marine general. Well, why is she running if she didn't go through the, jump through the normal hoops, and go through the normal process that she should have gone through to be the nominee? Who was his longest serving mm. chief of staff, gave an interview recently in the last two weeks of this election, talking about how dangerous Donald Trump is. And I think one has to think. There you go with the dangerous, the fear mongering, maybe inciting, maybe influencing someone else that may have a deranged mindset to try and hurt the man or kill the man. Think about why would someone who served with him, who was not political, a four star Marine general, why is he telling the American people now? And frankly, I think of it as, as he's just putting out a 911 call to the American people. <laughs> yeah, okay. Donald Trump were back in the White House. Okay. And this time, we must take very seriously those folks who knew him best and who were career people are not going to be there. So well, I know Joe, Judge Joe Brown told us about some people that knew you very well, Kamala. And the stuff that, as a matter of fact, why don't you all go and watch all the interviews of Joe Brown? <laughs> Go watch Judge Brown, Judge Joe Brown, all his look up Judge Brown, Judge Joe Brown, Kamala Harris. Look at all those interviews. Whoa. Whoa. I ain't saying they true, but whoa. <laughs> him back. At least before there were folks who we know what he would say, but they would restrain him. Imagine now. Donald Trump in the Oval Office, in the situation. You know what, too? She doesn't have president feel. Um, I could have seen Hillary as president. I'm not saying I would have voted for her. What I'm saying is, you understand what I'm saying? She does have a, uh, a certain command to her presence. Um, definitely Tulsi. I could definitely see Tulsi as president. I'm not sure about Michelle Obama, but I know that Michelle Obama, if she ran, she could have definitely gave Trump a run for the money. You get what I'm saying? And, you know, there were former presidents where, you know, I, I, where it's like, I, I'm not exactly, they didn't exactly have president feel. Uh, the second Bush didn't have that feel to me. Something wasn't right about that. Um, Who else? I was thinking about this earlier. There was someone else I was thinking of that really didn't have president feel to him. I can't think of it right now, but. He who has openly admired dictators said he would be a dictator on day one. The former. And when he said it, he said it in jest, he said, oh, only for a day, only for a day. Drill, baby, drill in this. And it's like, oh, my God, he wants to be a dictator chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff has said he is a fascist to the core. So I think that when the American... Hey, I got a question. What's the difference between a king or a dictator? Is there really any difference? I would like to know. Um, because I'm just like, okay, well, if dictator is a way of saying king, well, if you're a good king, if you're good at running the country, and you're good at protecting the country, and, you, and it's people... I don't understand what's wrong with being a king, but let me let me look it up right now. Let me look it up now. Because I heard someone say the other day, hey, man, he wants to be a king. He wants to be a dictator for them. I'm like, wait a minute. So are, are king and dictator the same thing? What's the difference between a king and a dictator? According to simple Wikipedia, differences, kings and emperors. Kings and emperors often use force and fear too, but usually they are not called dictators. This is because those monarchs have some reason for being in power. Usually their father was king or emperor, but a dictator gained power himself. Ah, so that's the slight difference. Yeah, hey, listen though, this whole f using force and fear, more than kings, emperors, and dictators use force 
and fear to rule people. This whole entire world is ruled through fear. If you don't do this, then that. If you do this, then that. Correct? You know that whole Green Lantern and, and, and Yellow Lantern thing? What's the most powerful? In reality, in reality, Yellow Lanterns would be the most powerful. People are ruled through fear. They are. Even with religion, correct? You don't serve God properly? Hell. Damnation. <laughs> or else. So parents raise their kids. Hey, do that. Or you get the, the you get the, 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 the belt. Okay, for you Spanish people, you get the chancleta. Okay? You get the papau. You get the papau. Okay? So it's... People reflect, especially those who are undecided, on who you should listen to. Don't take my word for it. In fact, go online and listen to John Kelly, his voice, talking about what he thinks of Donald Trump two weeks before the election. Because I think we all know, to your point, Anderson, it is close, but there are undecided voters who clearly, by being here, have an open mind, want to talk in a way that is about grounded in issues and fact. And when they hear these facts, I think it, it compels a lot of people to be concerned about the future of our country with Donald Trump at the lead. You quoted General Milley calling Donald Trump a, a fascist. You yourself have not used that word to describe him. Let me ask you tonight, do you think Donald Trump is a fascist? Yes, I do. Yes, I do. Well, that was a straight up and yes I, answer. And I also Finally got a yes answer from her. On this subject should be trusted. Again, look at their careers. These are not people, with the exception, I think, of only Mike Pence. These were not politicians. These are career people who have served in, 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 in the highest roles in national security, who have served as generals in our military, who are highly respected, talking about the person who would be commander in chief, not to mention what we know and what they've told us about he ta how he talks about the military, servicemen and women referring to them as suckers and losers. How he, he demeans people who have taken an oath to sacrifice their life for our country. Same and old, I do believe, old. Anderson, that part of this is why even just this week, I, I traveled this state and others with Liz Cheney, former Congress member who was a very high ranking Republican. This she is, has this endorsed is brutal. me, her father, the former Vice President of the United States, Dick Cheney, is voting for me. Cool. Over 400. Cool story, bro. <laughs> members of, previous members of the, the, the administration from Ronald Reagan to both Presidents Bush to Donald Trump, even, have endorsed my candidacy. And the reason why among them is a legitimate fear based on Donald Trump's words and actions that he will not obey an oath to support and defend the Constitution of the United States. He himself has said he would terminate the Constitution of the United States and wants to earn your vote to stand again behind the seal of the President of the United States. No one standing behind the seal of the President of the United States of America should be in that position. You can tell it's going in one ear and out the other with me because she she has proved over and over and over again that she's a bad actor with this. You know what I mean? It's just, it's, she, she, she too many people, including myself, it's just like, it, it comes off as an act rather than, you know, sincerity. You know what I'm saying? From the switching, for, from the, the same scripted answers to everything, to the same scripted speeches at multiple rallies, to um, the switching of accents when speaking to different people, it all just seems fake and fraudish. And it's just like, I, I don't believe her, man. I'm not saying everything she says is lies, but it just seems as this fake try hard. It, it, Act, it doesn't work for me, man. Saying they want to terminate.
the Constitution of the United States. By the way, you know, there's been rumors that people are saying that basically that Joe Biden hasn't been running the country. Many people, it's a theory, people say that it's a theory that Obama is truly running the nation, um, you know, behind the scenes. But if that's true, wow, then he ain't doing too well, is he? You better put it on Joe and uh, Kamala. <laughs> get to some of our voters this is a i want you to meet a registered republican who's very concerned about trump's views on democracy and january 6. she told us she's looking for a reason to vote for you but is yet to make her final decision her name is natasha kwiatkowski she's a student at Bryn Mawr college what's your question natasha? the sternness of that dude's face back here kind of reminds me of uh is it american psycho what is it with uh chris uh, batman you know what i'm talking about, <sighs> you know what I'm talking about? It, it, Kind of reminds me that the haircut there, I think, kind of reminds me. Of she told us she's looking for a reason to vote for you. Christian Bale. Her final yeah. decision. Her name is Natasha Kwiatkowski. She's a student at Brigham I've never College. seen that movie, by the way. Natasha. Awesome. Thank you uh, for being here, and thank you for taking my question. Thank you, Natasha. And as someone who hasn't fully committed to either party, how do you plan to address the concerns of in independent voters and anti-Trump Republicans like myself who feel left out of the polarized political landscape and what specific actions would you take to bridge the political divide and create more unity? That's, That's a, hard a wonderful one for question. Uh, I pledge to you to be a president for all Americans. And I think to the point of, in the spirit of your question, that people are frankly exhausted with what has been happening over the last several years, which is this environment that is suggesting that- Listen. What she has been saying, what they have been saying about him has only divided us more because you've got millions of people in this country that are ready to vote for him. Yet you're saying that who they want to vote for is a psychotic dictator, fascist. You have to remember whether people realize it or not, when they identify with people, just like when I talk about a movie and I don't like the movie, if I say the movie's bad, I know that people are going to identify with that. And it's a much, much less scenario. And I'm always in, a, in so many words expressing to people that, like, just calm down, it's entertainment. Just because I don't like this movie doesn't mean I don't like you because you identify with this movie. But people identify with this man seriously and his values and his policies and what he wants to do. For you to call him psycho is calling them psycho. Okay? For you to call him a dictator says that they want a dictator. And everything else, I, it's, it, it's offensive to people. So, and when you say he's dangerous, you're saying that their decision to vote for him is dangerous. People don't like that. People get offended. And that makes them not like you more, you know? And um, it's, it's like politics is so tiptoey and eggshells. And you just, you, uh, good Lord, I would never want to be in it. I, I couldn't handle it. I couldn't, I, you know. It was ridiculous. I'd be like, man, I said this and watched them twist it up. You know, I'm a YouTuber and I've had my word twisted. I'm like, good Lord, if I got into politics. That Americans should be pointing fingers at one another. That we are divided as a nation instead of what I think. I'm going to try to get through this. I'm just saying she, she doesn't feel genuine to me. And I feel that someone's not genuine to me. I don't want to listen to them. You know, I'm out here in these streets. Okay. All right. You and I, I will speak for us, I think, um, who believe and know the vast majority of us have so much more in common than what separates us. And I think that the American people deserve to have a president who is grounded in what is common sense, what is practical, and what is in the best interest of the people, not themselves. Okay, well, common sense to me is not wanting to kill your unborn children. Okay. He has the common sense of not wanting to do that. He only has the exceptions out there. There you go. So, what's common sense now? You know? <laughs> well, 
But I started my career as a prosecutor. And I will tell you. That's real, I've though. Who, in my who would use people. common sense to want to kill their own unborn child? Who would want to do that? It doesn't make no sense to me. How? My How's that common? There's no DC, way that's way. common. Only four years when I was in the Senate were in Washington. You were taught um, that. Other than being vice president. I have never in my career as a prosecutor asked a, a victim or a witness of a crime, are you a Democrat or a Republican? The only thing I have ever asked is, are you okay? And I do believe I've heard that, that before. <laughs> deserve in their president. It's the same broken record. Makes decisions based on who voted for them, or what is in their personal interest. And I reference that because, as we know, it has been revealed that Donald Trump, when he was president, during extreme disasters, when it came time to determine how those areas, those people who had been traumatized. Now, I do remember. When before I was really paying attention to everything to, to anything at all, um, when I first started dating Leticia Scarlo from Puerto Rico, Car Scarlo was Puerto Rican. Okay, Scarlo's Puerto Rican, pass it along. Um, I said something about Trump, I was talking about something, and she got kind of huffy. <laughs> You know, and I I didn't know why she was huffy about it. She was like, the way he treated Puerto Rico. when the, the, I was like, oh, I forgot about that. Now, listen, I was only seeing clips here and there on Twitter or YouTube. I don't know the full story about him sending aid to Puerto Rico. What I had heard was that he was really slow to act with help in Puerto Rico. Is that true? Is it not? What's the real story on it? Like I said, I don't see any of these candidates being free from dirt under their nails or controversy or problems, okay? Like I said, he's the lesser of the two evils, though, okay? I still felt better when he was in office, in all ways. Right now, I don't feel better about anything, okay? Everything felt better about my life when he was in office, Get it? Okay. So, but I just, I, I, I need to know that. By extreme weather would get relief. He asked the question, did they vote for him? I believe the American people deserve better. And they deserve okay? a president who is focused on solutions, not sitting in the Oval Office plotting their revenge and retribution. Doesn't well, matter. It doesn't matter because I'm not talking about that last part she said. I'm thinking about how she's just like, well, did you vote for me? But it's all about, are you going to vote for me? And did you vote for me? It's all about that. You saying, are you okay? Is still trying to get a vote. Oh, she cares about me. I'm going to vote for her. That's it's it's a roundabout way. You know? Introduce you to uh, Eric Swenson. He runs a service desk for an IT company in uh, Concha Hawk in Pennsylvania. He's registered as a libertarian. Describes himself as an independent. He says he's undecided. Eric. Thank you, Anderson. Thank you both for being here. Thank you, Eric. So my question is concerning groceries. Grocery yeah. prices have gone up uh, quite a bit in the last four years. <sighs> and some people... I've heard this answer so many times to groceries. I do not want to hear this. <laughs> Hopefully it's different. Hopefully it's different. Blame former President Trump. Some people blame President Biden. Who would you say is correct? And Of course, she's going to blame Trump. <laughs> What would you do to bring prices down for Americans? Thank you, Eric. And you're absolutely right. You know it. I know it. I think most Americans know it. Price of groceries is still too high. And we need to address it in a number of ways. One of my aspects of doing what we need to do to bring down the cost of living for working people and the middle class in America is to address the issue of grocery prices. Part of my background and how I come to it is probably a new approach grounded in a lot of my experiences as a former attorney general where I took on price gouging. And my, part of my plan is to create a new approach that is the first time that we will have a national ban on price gouging, which is companies taking advantage of the desperation and need of the American consumer. No, I like that. I like that. Now, that's a good Kamala thing. I like that. And jacking up prices. You damn right. Consequence or accountability.
So that is one. I like to that. Point, Eric. There, you know, there are a number of issues that we need to address in terms of bringing down the cost of living. It includes what we need as a. Y'all think y'all was gonna hear me say that? I like that. I told you I'm fair. Okay, I'm real. If I like it, I'm gonna tell you I like it. If I don't like it, I'm gonna tell you I don't like it. I'm gonna tell you the truth. T R U F E. Truth. Really, a new approach that I bring to. The, the issue of affordable housing, including, for example, rent. And again, I bring to it my experience, knowing what has been happening in terms of how corporations have been buying up blocks of property to diminish competition, and then rents get jacked up, and addressing that, both in terms of making sure that there is a consequence and accountability for that, but also investing in people's <laughs> dreams of home ownership you know, knowing that for too long. It was funny. She, she keeps saying jacked up instead of they raise the prices. <laughs> um, <laughs> jacked up is a term that I always hear old black people use. Always. Now, I know Kamala is a chameleon and she changes her accents and all this other stuff. It makes me wonder if that is a term that she picked up. He's like, cause let the man, let me tell you, I can't listen. I was in sales, like I said, for like around eight years, maybe more. But, and you know, I would hear people say, and it was always, especially an older black man. It's talking about, yeah, they bring you in on this price and then they jack it up to this. You know what I'm saying? It's, it was always an older black man talking about jacking up a price. Also, just so you don't know. For you guys that ain't up on the slang, getting jacked up is somebody beating you up, okay? So you hear an old black man, so you better get out of here before I jack you up, sucker. Get out of there. He might got some hands on him, trust me. Some old black men can really fight. They will take you out <laughs> in a second. <laughs> um, frankly, both administrations, I mean, both administrations mm. and both parties, Democrats and Republicans, haven't done enough to deal with the issue of housing. And we need a, pr a new approach that includes working with the private sector. I say that as a, as a, as a developed public servant, working with the private sector to cut through the red tape, working with home builders, working with developers to create tax incentives so that we can create more housing yeah. supply and bring down the price. Let, let me just ask you about price gouging. I looked at your plan. Uh, you talk about going after price gougers and I'm quoting from the plan on essential goods during emergencies or times of crisis. I get that. How does that help, though, someone like Eric with prices that for years, the grocery price has just been high? All right. Now, if it's only in times of crisis, then that's, you know, because we, we all, man, price gouging is, you know, they were just talking about this with, um, Concert prices when we, with Ticketmaster and their monopoly on tickets and what they were doing. I'm just like, they're doing is disgusting. You know what I'm saying? Disgusting. And I'm just like, man, you know, I wish they would put an end to that too. So mm, here come the specifics. Good one, Mr. Cooper, Silver Fox. Well, first of all, Anderson, as you know, and obviously CNN has been covering extensively. Uh, what has been happening in the state of Georgia, North Carolina, Florida. It's a real issue. Uh -huh. I, I was attorney general of California. I was the top law enforcement officer of the biggest state in the country. I took this issue on because it affects a lot of people. And I'm not going to so apologize much. for the fact that we need to actually deal with accountability when these, not all, in fact, most don't, but when Companies are taking advantage of the desperation and the need of the American people. We saw it actually during the pandemic as well, where because of supply chain issues, we there. That's not he's at, he's asking something else. There was a, a reduction of supply, and then they would inflate the price of everyday necessities. Not to mention, by the way, again, Donald Trump should be here tonight to talk with you and answer. Here we go, more Trump. But understand that part of his plan is to put in place a national sales tax of at least 20% mm -hmm. on everyday goods and necessities. And that by economists, independent economists, 
Right, would cost you as the American consumer and taxpayer an additional four thousand dollars a year. Uh, I want you to meet Carol Nackenoff, okay. a uh, political science professor at Swarthmore College. She's a registered Democrat who said she's leaning toward voting for you. Has yet to make her final decision. Carol. Hi, Carol. Thank Good you. evening. Uh, thank Good you evening. for visiting us in Delaware County, um, Vice President Harris. My question is this: Interesting choice if of you glasses. Could accomplish <laughs> only one major policy goal that required congressional action. What would it be, and why? Well, there's not just one. I have to be honest with you, Carol. Where's Montel Williams during all this? I know they have tried to get some some him him to do some interviews. I I <laughs> bet everything on it. <laughs> I bet the farm on it. They have been wanting to get this dude to do an interview on her. I bet you. <laughs> Um, there's a lot of work that needs to happen, but let's let's. I think that maybe part of this point that I, how I think about it is we've got to get past this era of politics and partisan politics, slowing down what we need to do in terms of progress in our country, and that means working across the aisle. I've done that before. We did it around whether it be what we were able to accomplish with the bipartisan infrastructure deal or some of the work that we have done in terms of dealing with gun safety. But we've got to work across the aisle. And it is my commitment to work with Democrats, with Republicans, with independents, to deal with a number of issues, whether it be what we need to do in terms of housing and creating legislation that creates incentives for that, what we need to do to reinstate the freedom of a woman to make decisions about her own body and not have her government tell her what to do, whether it be what we need to do to actually invest in a substantial way in the industries of the future, in American-based manufacturing. They always talk about the woman's body, but they never talk about that baby's body. Why doesn't the baby have any rights to its life? Hmm. I wonder why. In American-based industries where American workers and union workers have those jobs in a way that is good paying jobs that gives people the dignity they deserve. All of those areas I plan on working across the aisle and with Congress, including the issue of immigration, which we've got to fix. Let, let me ask you, you've talked about- Y'all been busting them in! What the- <laughs> Codifying Roe v. Wade, that would obviously require 60 votes in, in the Senate, oh, uh, a majority of, of the House. That's a big, that's a big leap. You don't. We don't have that yet. If that's not possible to codify it in the House, what do you do? I think we need to take a look at the filibuster, to be honest with you. But the, the reality of it is this. Let's talk about how we got here. When Donald... I always hear about that. And I, the last time I remember seeing something on it was when I was watching um, Scandal. And it talked about the president's wife filibustering for like three hours or whatever. What is a filibuster? Come on now. The most political procedure in which one or more members of a legislative body prolong debate on proposed legislation so as to delay or entirely prevent a decision. Huh. Trump was president. He hand selected three members of the United States Supreme Court with the intention that they would undo the protections of Roe v. Wade. And they did as he intended. And now in 20 states, we have Trump abortion bans that include punishing health care providers, doctors and nurses in Texas. Do you know they provide for prison for life? For from, a health care provider? For murder? For doing the job that they believe is in the best wow, interest of their patients? Wow, murder. Interesting. Ju okay. Laws, Trump abortion bans, some that make no exception even for rape or incest. One of the areas I special in as a pro specialized in as a prosecutor, prosecutor. crimes against women and children. The idea you would tell a survivor of a... <laughs> Everybody, <laughs> a bunch of y'all sent me that. It was like an interview of some woman that Kamala sent to jail on some trumped up stuff. No no pun intended. <laughs> or maybe pun intended. Uh, I, I saw clips of that before and I was just like, man. Okay violation to their body that they have no right to make a decision about what happens to their body next the child should also have rights to his life this is what's happening in our country you all may have heard the stories women have died women have 
die because of these laws. People have died because of having abortions. They don't, that's the thing they tell you about all the complications where you might be sterile, you might die, you might have problems having children in the future, all that stuff. Come on now. Put your big girl in guy pants on and um, rightfully uh, raise the child properly. All right. Accountability. Accountability is kryptonite to most people, men and women. They don't want to to take on accountability, responsibility of being an adult. You know what I mean? And the suffering, I have to say, Anderson, traveling. For example, I, again, I was with Liz Chan. Suffering. The suffering of being torn apart in the womb, having your skull crushed. Mm. This week. Is that the suffering she's she talking about? Unapologetically pro life. And will also tell you that she doesn't agree with what's been happening. I, I find that many people I've met who are pro life have said to me, you know, I didn't intend that this would happen. I would I didn't intend that women who are suffering a miscarriage would develop sepsis, as has happened. Many times, I didn't intend that women would die. I didn't intend that there would now be restrictions on access to in vitro fertilization. I didn't intend that there would be an effort to limit access to contraception. So, you know, this is probably one of the most... And I heard Trump say he wasn't for that. The whole in vitro thing that people were talking about. You know what I mean? And I pretty much wholeheartedly agree with the whole saving the mother's life stuff you know what i'm saying and uh the other two so you know what i mean uh, i think in certain specific situations um i think it should be a case by case but um like if i had to have a blanket state blanket statement with it yeah i'm fine with the three exceptions but you know the rest got to go because the, the, and then the three exceptions are only like, I don't know, 1% or less than 1% of all abortions anyway. So it's like the rest of everybody is just irresponsible adults. That's all it is. Lack of accountability. You know what I'm saying? Fundamental freedoms that we as Americans could imagine, which is the freedom to literally make decisions about your own body. And on some issues... I think we've got to agree that partisanship should be put aside. And I'll close with this point. I know it is possible because when you look at the midterms in so-called red states and so-called blue states, when this issue of freedom was on the ballot. Oh, I got it. Vote blue no matter who and vote red until you're dead. There you go. Those are the two now. <laughs> The American people voted for freedom. Considering you have been in the position of vice president for the past four years under the Biden administration, how can we expect you to deviate from the direction of that administration compared to your own? How can we differ position Wait, of red states and so-called blue states? When this issue of freedom was on the ballot, the American people voted for freedom. Considering you have been in the position of vice president for the past four years under the Biden administration, how can we expect you to deviate from the direction of that administration compared to your own? How can we differentiate your policy and your beliefs from that of Biden's? That's a great question, and thank you. Well, first of all, my administration will not be a continuation of the Biden administration. I bring to this role my own ideas and my own experience. I represent a new generation of leadership on a number of issues and believe that we have to actually take new approaches. For example, what we talked about in terms of housing, I my experience that leads to that priority includes what I did to take on the big banks around the foreclosure crisis when I brought billions of dollars to homeowners that were the subject of predatory lending. I know what homeownership means to the American people, not to mention what it meant to my mother who worked very hard and saved up so that by the time I was a teenager, she was able to buy our first home. I bring- Why don't she ever talk about her dad, by the way? Oh yeah, they're estranged. But um, home ownership ain't everything is cracked up to be. I'm letting you know as someone who knows who's done both. I think that you should definitely uh, I know the American dream. Oh, the White House picket fence, two and a half children. Uh, listen, 
Look into what's best for you. Truly understand the pros and cons of renting and the pros and cons of home ownership. Trust me. To it, my experience, actually taking care of my mother when she was sick, and it was, as it turned out, dying from cancer. And so I know what it means and have the experience of taking care of an elderly relative, and I have raised children. And so I bring to my priorities and will as president a new approach and a new idea, frankly, about what we need to do to deal with the sandwich generation, which is what we call those folks who are literally in the middle, who are raising their young children and taking care of their parents, which is why Uh my plan and approach says, hey, you shouldn't have to, to, to wipe out all your savings to qualify for Medicaid to be able to get support to hire somebody to help you cook for your parent or help them put on a sweater. I've done that, I know what that requires. You shouldn't have to quit your job in order to do the work that is necessary to take care of your children and your parent because it's overwhelming to try to do it all. And so my plan is to have and allow Medicare to cover the cost of home health care for our seniors. These are a couple of examples, including what we talked about in terms of price gouging and what we need to do in addition. And it's a new approach that I think it's well overdue. Let's invest in the small businesses of America. I, I, uh, the woman who helped raise us was a small business owner. I know who small business owners are. I know what they do. They are the backbone of America's economy. And for too long, we've overlooked their value to the economy as a whole, much less to the economy of neighborhoods and communities. So that's why my plan, and it's a new approach, is about tax cuts for our small businesses so that they can invest in themselves and grow and in the process invest in communities, invest in neighborhoods, and strengthen our economy overall. So those are some examples. It's about a new approach, a new generational leadership based on new ideas and frankly, different experiences. I bring a whole set of different experiences to this job and the way I think about so, it than, some, than Joe Biden. Some voters though might ask, you've been in the White House for, for four years, you were vice president, not the president, but why wasn't any of that done for the last four years? Well, there was a lot that was done, there's more to do, Anderson. And, and I'm pointing out things that need to be done, that haven't been done, but need to be done. Done. Job, and the way I think about some, it, than, some, than Joe Biden. Some voters, though, might ask, you've been in the White House for four years, you were vice president, not the president, but why wasn't any of that done for the last four years? Well, there was a lot that was done, but there's more to do, Anderson. And, <laughs> and I'm pointing out things that need to be done. She called him Anderson. <laughs> that irritated her. <laughs> I used to get into certain arguments every once in a while with certain girlfriends. And the majority of the time, 99% of the time, I'm my pet name. I'm babe. I'm hun. I'm love. But when they say, well, I, I didn't do that yet, Tyrone. Whoa! What, you mad now? <laughs> be done. That haven't been done, but need to be done. And I'm not going to shy away from saying, hey, these are still problems that we need to fix. Um, I want you to meet Jackson Weiss, who's hey. at Drexel University from Flowertown, Pennsylvania. Nah, same. Republican says he's leaning toward voting for you, but has yet to make a, a final decision. Jackson. Thank you, Anderson. Hey, Jackson. Thank you for taking the time to be here, too, Vice President Harris. Thank you. Regarding the rapid increase in the migrant population, how will you ensure that every immigrant is integrated into American society safely? What benefits and subsidies Wait, are you providing the rap? I was on. Republican <laughs> says he's leaning toward voting for you, but has yet to make a, a final decision. Okay. Jackson. Thank you, Anderson. Hey, Jackson. Thank you for taking the time to be here, too, Vice President Harris. Thank you. Regarding the rapid increase in the migrant population, how will you ensure that every immigrant is integrated into American society safely? What benefits and subsidies will you provide them with? And how long will these benefits and subsidies last for an individual? Most importantly, Will the American citizens taxes pay for these benefits and subsidies? And if so, how much money, how much money will be allocated? I'll tell you this. You know, I was watching something the other day and I'm just like, yo, these uh, in, uh, immigrants that they're busting in, they are getting better benefits than the American people. How can you vote for a party doing that to you? Oh my God. Yo! 
Well, thank you, Jackson. Let's start with this. America's immigration system is broken and it needs to be fixed. And it's been broken for a long time. And part of what we need to do is always prioritize what we need to do to strengthen our border. I will tell you I'm the only person in this race among the two choices that voters have. I've personally prosecuted transnational criminal organizations oh, in the trafficking of guns, stuff. drugs, and human beings. I have Amazing. spent a significant part of my career making sure that our border is secure and that we do not allow criminals in and we don't allow that kind of trafficking to happen and come into our country. And as the as my opponent has proven himself, Here we go, Donald he Trump. would prefer to run on the problem instead of fix the problem. You may know there were some of the most conservative members of the United States Congress working with others that came up with a border security bill that would have put 1,500 more board agents well, here we at go the border. With this one. Those board agents are overwhelmed. They need the support. They need the backup. Mm -hmm. It would have allowed us to have more resources to stem the flow of fentanyl. I don't need to tell this state and people around the country what is happening in terms of the scourge of fentanyl and how it is literally killing Americans. It would have put resources into stemming the flow. It would have given more resources to prosecute, to investigate and prosecute transnational criminal organizations. It would have done a lot of good. Donald Trump got wind of the bill and told them, don't put it forward. He killed the bill because he preferred to run on a problem instead of fixing a problem. We have to have a secure border and we have to have a comprehensive pathway for citizenship. Let, let and that includes requiring people hardworking people to earn citizenship and do it in a comprehensive, humane, and orderly manner. Let me ask you about that. I mean, you talk about the bill that Donald Trump quashed. That before. was in 2024. You talk about the bill he tried to get passed in 2021. That wasn't able to get passed. 2022, 2023, there were record border crossings. You, your administration took a number, hundreds of executive actions. It didn't stem the flow. Numbers kept going up. Finally, in 2024, uh, just in June, three weeks before the, last, the first presidential debate with Joe Biden, uh, you institute executive actions that had dramatic impact, really shut down people crossing over. Why didn't your administration do that in 2022, 2023? First of all, you're exactly right, Anderson. And as of today, we have cut the flow of immigration by over half. In fact, the numbers I saw most recently, illegal immigration. But if is it was that easy with that finish. executive me, action, why not do it in 2022, well, 2023? Because we were working with Congress and hoping that actually we could have a long-term fix to the problem instead of a short-term fix. You couldn't have done one and the, both at the same time? Well, here's the thing. <laughs> we have to understand that ultimately this problem is going to be fixed through congressional action. Congress has the authority and the purse. I, I hate to use DC terms, but literally they write the checks. Part of the issue is in order to really fix the problem at the border. I was just at the border recently talking with border agents. You know what they talk about? Yes, they are overwhelmed. They're working around the clock. And the other thing that they talked to me about, we need more judges down there to deal with asylum claims. We need more personnel down there to deal with processing. And, but you just get into all these damn complexes that these gangs then took over. <laughs> that's what we need y'all to do. Anderson, and that's fix that. Good in lord. In terms of dedicating the resources to actually fixing the problem, we have dealt with it such that, to your point, we now, as of today, as of our our visit have lower undocumented immigrants and illegal immigration than Trump when he left office. That, that's true. But we need a permanent solution, and that requires you done that? bipartisan work. Do you wish you'd done those executive orders in 2022, 2023? I think we did the right thing, and but the, the best thing that can happen for the American people is that we have bipartisan work happening, and I pledge to you, that I will work across the aisle to fix this long-standing problem. I think the American people are demanding it yeah. on both sides of the aisle, and it's time we actually put the partisan approach to this aside. We know what can work. No, my thoughts are to this. Yeah, you'll fix it if you get in the office. Because, you know, the whole thing is everybody's like, yeah, they, they brought them all in just to win the election. That's what it's about, getting those... Um, electoral votes and you know everything so 
Yeah, of course you will after you win it. Will you, though? Well, let's talk about this compromise bill you that you want to pass if you're elected. You said that's going to be a priority. It includes $650 million in funding for the border wall. That's something Republicans wanted. That was part of the compromise. Under Donald Trump, you criticized the wall more than 50 times. You called it stupid, useless, and a medieval vanity project. Is a border wall stupid? <laughs> well, let's talk about Donald Trump and that border wall. <laughs> So remember, Donald Trump said Mexico would pay for it? Come on. They didn't. They didn't. No, that's true. How much of that wall did he build? I think the last... I thought it was hilarious when he was on his way. Like, they had footage, like, you know, he's on his way to, to, to Mexico, speaking to Mexican president. And then they're like, Donald Trump's Air Force One has turned around. After <laughs> I thought that that was funny. I did. But, um... Yeah, they did. They didn't pay for it. So. I saw is about two percent, and then when it came for time for him to do a photo op, you know where he did it? In the part of the wall that President Obama built. But you're agreeing so to a bill on. that would earmark six hundred and fifty million dollars to continue building that we, wall. I, I pledge that I am going to bring forward that bipartisan bill to further strengthen and secure our border. Yes, I am, but and I am going to work across the aisle to pass com a comprehensive bill that deals with a broken immigration system. I think Jackson's question, part of it was to acknowledge that America has always had migration, but there needs to be a legal process for it. People have to earn it. And that's the point that I think is the most important point that can be made, which is we need a president who is grounded and shot, shot. Wait, let me finish. <laughs> like, let's just fix this thing. Let's just fix it. Why is there any ideological perspective on it? Let's just fix the problem. It, 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 to fix the problem, you're you're doing this compromise bill. It does call for six hundred fifty million dollars that was earmarked under Trump to actually still go to build the wall. I'm not afraid of good ideas where they occurred. You don't, so you don't think it's stupid anymore? I think what he did and how he did it did, was did not make much sense because he actually didn't do much of anything. I just talk, talked about that wall, right? We just talked about it. Um, this is Annalise Keene. She's huh. in Philadelphia. She works as a fundraiser for Habitat for Humanity. See the cuts in the clips, right? <laughs> Kennedy, she's registered with no party affiliation. She says she's a Democrat. She's leaning toward voting for you, but says she's yet to make her final decision in part because of the conflict in the Middle East. Annalise? Thank you, and good evening, Madam Vice President. Good evening. My question is, as president, what would you do to ensure not another Palestinian dies due to bombs being funded by U.S. tax dollars? Mm. So. <laughs> so. Uh, uh, all right. So <laughs> this is what we're going to do. And I think this is to your point. <laughs> far too many innocent Palestinian civilians have been killed. It's unconscionable. And we are now at a place where with Sinmar's death, I do believe we have an opportunity to end this war, bring the hostages home, bring relief to the Palestinian people and work toward a two state solution where Israel and the Palestinians in equal measure have security, where the Palestinian people have dignity, self-determination and the safety they, that they so rightly deserve. What, what do you say to voters who are thinking about supporting a third party candidate or staying on the couch, not voting at all because of this issue? Listen, I am not going to deny the strong feelings that people have. I don't know that anyone who has seen the images um, who would not have strong feelings about what has happened, much less those who have relatives who have died and been killed. And I, and I know people and have talked with people. So I appreciate that. But I also do know that for many people who care about this issue, they also care about bringing down the price of groceries. They also care about our democracy and not having a president of the United States who admires dictators and is a fascist. They also care about the fact that we need practical common sense solutions from a leader who is willing to work across the aisle on behalf of the. She's wearing the same earrings that everybody said are Bluetooth. I don't know whether they are or not. So allegedly, but 
yeah. the American people and not themselves. Mm-hmm. Uh, they want a president who cares about a fundamental freedom to make decisions about your own body. Oh. Understanding that we're not trying to change anyone's belief, but let's not have the government telling women what to do with their body. I want you to meet Beth Sandberg. She's a realtor. They're not telling you what to do with your body. They're telling you what to do with the child's body. And they're telling you not to kill the child. That's what they're telling you not to do. From mom of four from Bella Kingwood, Pennsylvania. She's a registered Democrat. Says she's undecided because of concerns about anti-Semitism. Beth? Hi, thank you for being here. Thank, you, thank you for remembering we need to bring the hostages home. Of course. The rise of anti-Semitism and violence from the rise of anti-Semitism and violence from anti-Semitism has risen greatly on college campuses and on our city streets in the last year. How would you combat this growing trend and protect our young adults? Thank you, Beth. Um, you are right, and I will say that we have seen a rise in anti-Semitism. It is something that we have to be honest about and we have to deal with as Attorney General. I actually published a hate crimes report um, on a regular basis, and anti-Semitism was among the highest forms of hate in our country, and this was before October 7th, and we know what we've seen since. Part of what we've got to do is talk with people so that they understand what are the tropes, what are the the roots of of what we are seeing, um, so that we can actually have people be more understanding. We need to have laws in place that make those who would commit crimes on behalf of anti-Semitism and hate, that they pay a serious consequence. We need to have the deterrence so that doesn't happen. We need to ensure that college students are safe in their school and feel safe to be able to go to class. But I'm going to tell you what doesn't help. Again, I invite you to listen and go online to listen to John Kelly, the former chief of staff. You're going to say something about Donald Trump Donald again? Trump, oh, my God. Who has told us, Donald Trump said, why, essentially, why aren't my generals like those Donald Hitlers? Trump, Donald Trump, Donald Trump, Donald like Trump, Hitler, Donald Trump, Donald Trump. Who has Trump, referred Trump. several times Good Lord. Words for years. Do you believe Donald Trump is anti-Semitic? God, everything is Donald Trump. I believe Donald Trump is a danger to the well-being and security of America. He has said that he he's casting himself as a protector of Israel. <laughs> Do you believe you would be more pro-Israel than Donald Trump? I believe that Donald Trump is dangerous. I believe that... There we go again with the danger. And you have a president of the United States who has said to his generals... You know, I think, you know, people keep telling them to stop with the dangerous rhetoric, with the dangerous propaganda. He's dangerous, he's dangerous, he's dangerous. Because you could get him shot again or shot at again or even killed. Yet they continue to do it. So that tells me that they have a total lack of caring about his life whatsoever and that they may allegedly be trying to make sure he gets taken out. I mean, you keep saying it. It's like national. And nationally, people keep saying, stop saying that because someone could try to kill him again. And they keep saying it over and over and over. Who work for him because he is commander in chief. These conversations, I assume many of them took place in the Oval Office. Oh, my God. And if the president of the United States, the commander in chief, is saying to his generals, in essence, why can't you be more like Hitler's generals? Anderson, come on. This is a serious, serious issue. And Anderson already said, don't none, don't none of us believe it. Don't none of us believe it. All the hearsay. We don't believe you. So it's, you know. Oh. <laughs> Who he is. He admires dictators sending love letters back and forth with Kim Jong-un. Talks about the president of Russia, and then most recently the reports are that in the height of COVID, when most Americans could not get their hands on a COVID test, Americans were dying by the hundreds a day. He secretly sent COVID tests to the president of Russia for his personal use. So again, there, this, this election in 13 days is presenting the American people with a very significant decision. And on the one side on this issue, 
of who is going to model what it means to use the bully pulpit of the President of the United States <laughs> in a manner that in tone, word, and deed is about lifting up our discourse, fighting against hate, as opposed to fanning the flames of hate, which Donald Trump does consistently. I, I'm going to tell you, we are an incredible country and we love our country. Y'all wouldn't be here. Fans, the flames Unless of hate. Unless we love our huh? country. And there are certain things where we've just got to come together and realize that, 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 we do believe in the importance of healthy debate on real issues, but there are certain standards we've got to have. And, you know, another point that even John Kelly talked about, I, I believe, and many have, is January 6th, where you have the President of the United States defying the will of the people in a free and fair election and unleashing a violent mob who attacked the United States Capitol, 140 law enforcement officers. Everything is Donald Trump. Killed. Good so Lord, I, I can she stand on say, anything other than blaming him for American everything? The people deserve to have a president who encourages healthy debate, works across the aisle, not afraid of good ideas wherever they come from, but also maintains certain standards. Good Lord, I've never seen about anything like this before, how man. We think about the role and the responsibility, <sighs> and certainly not comparing oneself in a clearly admiring way to Hitler. To Hitler, right. We're going to take a, a quick break. We'll have more uh, from Lord, the man. Town Hall of President Kamala One of the first You lucky I love y'all, man. President Biden announced that he was dropping out was to your pastor. <laughs> and I'm wondering, if it wasn't a confessional, if you could say what that conversation was like. Well, my pastor, Reverend Dr. Amos C. Brown, the Third Baptist Church, uh -huh. um, it was it was an extraordinary day that Sunday when um, the president called me and I I instinctively understood the gravity of the moment, the seriousness of the moment. I didn't predict or know exactly how that day would play out. And obviously now it's been three months since I've been at the top of the ticket, actually three months as of yesterday. But I just called him. I, I needed that spiritual kind of um, sure you did. connection. I needed that advice. I needed a prayer. And, um, and there's, a, there's a part of the scripture that talks about Esther and a time such as this. And, um, and that's what we talked about. And it was very comforting for me. And, um, do you and pray every day? I do pray every day. I do pray every day, sometimes twice a day. Um, I, you know, my, I grew up, so we grew up uh, in a little neighborhood church in Oakland, 23rd Avenue Church of God, and um, I was raised to believe in a loving God. I was going to say, you better not say middle class. To believe that your faith is a verb, you know, you, you, you live your faith and, um, and that, by the way. Um, every time I talk about religion, I always get these comments that swear they're explaining things properly and they never do. And they forget that, um, I studied the Bible for a very long time and Christians, just so you know, I know you're always trying to witness to people. You don't need to witness to me. Okay. Trust me on that. You know, everything that you guys say in the comments, I've already heard before. Like I know for years, you guys have commented. I never, ever see anything new. I, I know all the angles you're going to come at every issue. Okay. So, you know, you, you can stop witnessing to me. You can witness to other people. Don't witness to me. I'm fine. Trust me on that. I've been where you already are. And uh, my eyes have been open in a lot of ways. Okay. I believe in a grand, good creator and um his will will eventually be done and he will make everything right okay but i'm not a christian okay i'm not a muslim i'm not anything i'm just a man that believes in god and i pray every single day i talk to him like he's like ladies my best friend okay so just 
please leave me alone. <laughs> please <laughs> leave me alone. Because you all swear you got the answer. And I used to say the same stuff that you guys say. What's this thing with prophecy? Real quick. You know, someone will write something down and then thousands of years later it happens. But it was written down thousands of years later. So people that read it had a blueprint to do whatever was written down thousands of years later. That sounds like self-fulfilling. It sounds like, well, you already wrote the blueprint. All we have to do is do it. And then because it happens, that means that it's true. I've never understood why people believe that. I, I don't. That's why I have issues with all religious doctrine. Because they all say it was inspired by God or delivered by God or delivered by some angels. They all say the same thing. It was, but, but, you know what I mean? Oh, well, we can't really, oh, well, the plates are missing or, well, this is, uh, well, we can't really, yeah, I know. And that's why I'm done with all organized religion, period, point blank. Okay. Cause they all say they got the right answer. Can okay? none of them truly prove it. And I'm just, I'm done. I don't need it. Don't need no organized religion. Okay. It's just me and the big guy. We will hash it out ourselves. And if he wants me to be directed toward any particular organized religion, he'll put it in my heart to do so. And you know he will. Because your doctrine says so. Right? So let, let me and God do our own thing. Thank you. Appreciate it. That the way that one should do that is that your work and your life's work should be to think about how you can serve in a way that is uplifting other people, um, that is about caring for other people. And um, that guides a lot of how I think about my work and and um, what is important. Um, let's go to the voters. I want you to meet uh, Joe Donahue from Bucks County, Pennsylvania. He works yeah. in customer service. For Donahue. I ain't seen that he show in a while. He's a local election official. He's a registered Republican. He got the taco meat coming out the neck. Just like Henry Cavill in his Superman suit, man. He says he's undecided, doesn't agree with your stance on abortion, but he is concerned about what he calls Trump's demeanor and actions on January 6th. Joe? Joe. Thank you, Madam Vice President, and thank you, Anderson. Uh, Madam Vice President, everybody as human beings, we're not perfect. We have our flaws. We make mistakes. We have our weaknesses. Right. And the office of the presidency can sometimes bring those weaknesses out in ways that the incumbent may not expect. What weaknesses do you bring to the table and how do you plan to overcome them? <laughs> That's a great question, Joe. Um, well, I am certainly not perfect, <laughs> so let's start there. And um, I think that I, perhaps a weakness, some would say, but I actually think it's a strength, is I really do value having a team of very smart people around me who bring to my decision-making process, different perspectives. Well, that's interesting. Some perceive as a weakness, but she sees it as a strength. So she has a team of people that help bring certain perspectives that help her, I guess, make these decisions. I guess some people may see that as a weakness. It's like you need handlers. You need a team of people around you to get you to do the thing you need to do to steer you in the right direction because by yourself, you can't do it. I could see that. I, I could definitely understand that. But also, yes, it's a strength to have a good team of people around you to help you to do things. That's what several business owners and people that run organizations do. So I can see people looking at it both ways. Perspectives. I, um, my team will tell you, I am constantly saying, let's kick the tire on that. Let's kick the tires on it. Um, because, I, listen, I, as I mentioned earlier, I started my career as a prosecutor. I was a courtroom prosecutor. I've tried everything from low-level offenses to homicides. And I learned at a very early stage of my career and adult life Why do I keep that my same? actions have a direct impact on... I'm, I'm a career, I'm a prosecutor, middle class, and Donald Trump, 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 Trump man people in a very fundamental way. When I was Attorney General of California, I was oh, trained God. to what, what is 
How much longer do I got? Uh, okay, 20 more me, minutes. Okay. My words can move markets. I can, I think I can. So I take my role and responsibility as an elected leader very seriously. And I know the impact it has on so many people I may never meet. And that is why I engage and bring folks around. So I may not be quick to have the answer as soon as you ask it about a specific policy issue sometimes because I'm going to want to research it. I'm going to want to study it. I'm kind of a nerd sometimes. <laughs> I confess. <laughs> and some might call that a weakness, especially if you're, you know, in an interview or just kind of, you know, <laughs> being asked a certain question. She is funny, man. To have the right answer right Her now. and Trump are both funny in two different ways. The way, but that's how I. That's how I work. It, we, I don't think I've ever heard the former president admit a mistake. A lot of politicians don't. Is there something you can point to in your life, political life, or in your life in the last four years that you think is a mistake that you have learned from? No, no. I mean, I've no. I, I've made many mistakes, um, and they range from you know. <laughs> If you've ever parented a child, you know you make lots of mistakes, too. Um, in my role as... So straight Anderson face stay. And a lot of the people that answer the questions, their face stays straight, too. They're like, well, she's laughing. They're not. They're like, okay, answer the question. You know what I mean? Vice president, I mean, I've probably worked very hard at making sure that um, I am... No, I'd like to do it. I'd like to have to go on, on the panel. And made sure I answered a question, asked her a question that was going to make her laugh. And then when she laughed, I started laughing so we could both be laughing together. <laughs> I would have loved to thought to have done that. Well versed on issues. And um, I think that is very important. It's a mistake not to be well versed on an issue and feel compelled to answer a question. Um, I want you to meet Pam Thistle. She's from Winmore, Pennsylvania. Pam She's a realtor. Thistle. Mike Health quote of the day. Health tip of the day. Make sure that you are taking dandelion and milk thistle. That will keep your liver healthy. Okay. This thistle made me think of it. Hi, uh, just a year ago. She has two daughters in college. She registered with no party affiliation and says she's undecided. She has concerns about how you would handle the economy, Pam. Thank you. And thank you, Anderson. And happy belated birthday to thank you very much. I really I'm sorry uh, for your loss. Oh, sorry. thank you. Yes. And I'm really appreciative for you to be here and get to know you. Um, when you talk about rich people paying their fair necklace. share, mm -hmm. can you be more specific? Income taxes are already on a graduated scale where the more you make, the higher percentage you pay in taxes. So the rich are paying a disproportionate amount in taxes as it is. Over 40% of Americans don't pay any income taxes. Also, the really high earners may move their money offshore if there are disincentives in the U.S. This could impact the economy. I would like to hear more nuts and bolts about your economic plans. Sure. Thank you, Pam. Um, so first of all, it is the case in the United States of America that billionaires on average, pay. You know what sure. I almost look like. Um, so all right. First of Am I all, getting this loud and clear? It is. All right. The case working. in the United States of America that <laughs> billionaires, on average, pay less taxes as a percentage yeah. than teachers and firefighters and nurses. Yeah. I'm talking and about that, hard workers like like pound the street and have I, some success. I'm, yes. No. 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 I yes. understand, but I want to just let's Not set the, the let, really high. Let's set the scene, right? Yeah. So. When I say that the, the, the richest among us mm -hmm. need to pay their fair share, okay, I am referencing that, and I, I need to reference that because, sadly, Donald Trump, when he was president, gave Donald tax Trump. cuts to the richest, to billionaires and big corporations, which added trillions of dollars to our deficit. So that, sadly, needs to be said in a way that should be obvious, to your point, but is not given what he did. Now, in terms of what we need to do to bring down taxes, I have pledged and have a plan for a middle class tax cut that would. Well, my man's just said that he's trying to make it so we ain't got no income tax. That's who I'm, man. Come on, Trump. Affect 100 million Americans, including, for example, what we will do around small businesses in terms of tax deductions, in terms of 
what small businesses are now being mired in, in terms of a bureaucracy around they have to fill out and do their taxes in a way that actually holds them back. Part of my plan includes extending a middle class tax cut that would include a $6,000 tax cut, essentially a child tax credit for parents and young parents in particular. Knowing that the vast majority of our parents have a natural desire to parent their children well, but not always the resources. So this is going to include an extra amount of just money that people can use to pay for <laughs> child care, which is far too expensive for too many working families. And part of the issue here is this. We cannot and I will not raise taxes on anyone making See, she's rocking her Dave Batista pearl necklace right now, too. Less than four hundred thousand okay. okay. dollars a year, but we do need to take seriously the system that benefits the richest and does not help out working middle class Americans. I come from the middle class, and I believe that the middle class needs to there it is. To pay <laughs> pay, not just get by. But get <laughs> you're saying, well, what, 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 you, what you're saying is, anyone under four hundred thousand won't have taxes raised. Are you saying that? Anyone above 400000 will have a tax raise. I'm saying that there is going to be a parity around what the richest people pay in terms of their taxes. Right now, Anderson, you know, the document, it, it is well documented that some of the richest people in our country have gotten away with a zero tax rate. But if you're earning five hundred, six hundred, seven hundred thousand dollars $700,000 under your plan... There's a good it, chance your taxes go. It, it, this, we can't have this conversation without knowing what the, it's a very complicated situation, right? If you're talking about a small business owner, I'm going to bring down cut taxes for small businesses, right? Because I know that they need the overhead, the money that they need for overhead to actually benefit the growth of their business, which benefits our economy as a whole. Um, let's go to um, actually, uh, you know, I want to. There's something I was going to say about the, that with the taxes. About Pam, Pam, we mentioned her since Steve fault. died a year ago. You, you've talked about your mom, yeah. uh, Shamala Harris, who died 15 years ago. What has grief been like for you? Do you still <laughs> grieve? Yeah, you don't stop grieving. You don't stop grieving. I mean, um, the I I think that there is, you know. There are like two sides to a coin when you have lost somebody you love. And or that two sides to a coin, that phrase becomes evident, which is if you have had the blessing of a, a close and and important relationship with someone, then when you have the, the other side. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. That's what it is. The zero tax rate. Um, there are there are laws and loopholes and stuff that allow them to do that. And they're legal. So it's like, okay, I guess you'll have to change the law then. You know what I'm saying? Because, <laughs> you know, when you're big business owners, there's way to do, ways to do that. You know what I'm saying? Um, and like I said, it's all legal. And, it's, you know, um, I was reading a few of Ray Robert Kiyosaki's books. He, he frequently talked about that. You know, there's just certain ways where you, you move your assets and your profits in certain ways or whatever. So, that, you know, so I'm just like, oh, okay, well. Y'all the one that made it legal. So I guess you have to make it illegal or change something then if you want them to pay more rather than being able to pay zero taxes. You know what I'm saying? Like, if someone's doing something legally, how are you going to come down on it? So if Donald Trump didn't pay any taxes on something, I'm not mad at him if he used the law properly. You get what I'm saying? I'm not. I'm not just sitting here like an angry, oh, I'm angry that I'm not a billionaire Oh, you're in the lap of, lap of luxury. You need to pay it just to make me feel better because I don't know how to save money or build a fortune myself. And him, I mean, what was he gifted from his father? A million dollars or something that he turned into billions or whatever? And listen, let me tell you something. Like I said, as long as things are done legally, listen, just people that started from poverty and are now billionaires, they are now millionaires. They're now thousandaires doing way better than most people. Okay. So just people that start in the lap of luxury that end up broke. So I'm not, you know, as long as they both did it legally, we're all dealt different hand of cards when we're born. You can't pick your parents. So from there, you got to move and do what you got to do. You know what I'm saying? So I don't like this whole rich against the poor game that they play. Um, in a lot of instances, it's all different in certain contexts, but I, I, I don't like that coin is that when you lose them, the grief becomes even deeper. But I also believe that, for example, anyone who has lost 
a family member through cancer or an illness. My mother died from cancer. Um, it is important to try and remember them as they lived and not as they died because the grief can really weigh you down. I think the brain has a, a way of when you're grieving really spiraling down and it's important I think to try and remember those you have lost in a way they'd want to be remembered. And we are Why'd back. they cut that? Kamala Harris. I want you to meet Rob McPherson. He's the chief marketing officer. Why is that cut? He's a registered Republican from Media, Pennsylvania, who told us he's leaning towards voting for you, but his concerns about what he calls shifts in your policy positions. Rob? Thank you. Uh, thank you for being here, Vice President Harris. Um, so welcome to Delco. Thank you. Um, <laughs> here in Delco, we, uh, we pride ourselves on being authentic. Yeah. And um, much of what we have seen been... So do I. That's why y'all come here, because I tell y'all the truth no matter what. If I don't like it, I don't like it. If I like it, I like it. That's how it is. Say, have seen much of what you've been saying with regard to issues like law and order and fracking uh, reflect a more centrist view than what people are used to hearing from Kamala Harris, um, leaving some voters to wonder about the authenticity of your current, more moderate positions. Uh, can you talk a little bit about how your positions have shifted and why? Sure, and thank you. Um, so, first of all, on fracking, I've been very clear. We kind of dispensed with this in 2020. I am not going to ban fracking. I did not as vice president. In fact, as vice president, I cast the tie-breaking vote. That how's it had? How's it feel to have to keep repeating yourself over and over again, saying you're not going to do something? <laughs> it's funny that she keeps putting it out there about Trump, 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 Trump. I've heard her have to fight this fracking answer all the time. I'm not going to stop fracking. <laughs> now it has opened up more fracking leases. My value on the issue of what we need to do to invest in a clean energy economy and a clean energy future has not changed. But frankly, I now have the experience and perspective of having been vice president for almost four years. I've traveled the country. I know that we can invest in a clean energy economy and still not ban fracking and still work toward what we need to do to create more jobs and create U.S.-based jobs in a way that will be globally competitive. Fracking sounds like it should be a cuss word. It does. It sounds like it should be a... a, a a, a replacement for, for you know what fracking and yeah just like people say, they might say damn it but then people will say dang it <laughs> dang it is just a, a you know, replacement for damn it it's you know that's, that's what fracking sounds like. get your fracking as you mentioned I think there's just a whole lot of misinformation to be honest with you I have personally prosecuted very serious crime it's how I started my career. I spent most of my career as a prosecutor, not in Washington, D.C. You know what I saw someone bring up the other day? Um, her being married to a white man. And, you know, with the black community, uh, it's, it, I think it's, it's a touchy subject because there's, there's some black people that believe that you cannot be for the black community totally and marry someone that is not black there's some people that believe that you absolutely can i'm one of those people but with a caveat of you need to analyze the entire situation who is this person you know who is their wife or husband how do they uh, what are their policies what are their beliefs and I'm, I'm just talking about in life period though i'm just i'm talking about in life altogether but right now we're talking about politics but i'm just saying you you need to watch how this person conduct themselves what do they do you know in in the public eye you know how do they treat people how what do they say what do they you know what i mean because there are people that are quote unquote sellouts it's like you know they married somebody other than their own race because they have major problems with their own race or they don't like their skin color or they want to be some. But some people, it's just like they just found love through someone else. Happened to work together. They met them. Wow, we 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 mesh, you know. And um, I just think it's interesting because people are like, oh, well, you so yo, black this. Yo, you black now. Oh, OK. So you so black and black. Well, why did you marry a white man? So that's what I noticed a lot of people bringing up on her. Uh, the jury's out for me 
on that because I personally, you know, if, like I said, everything I've looked at says that she could possibly be one fourth African. Okay. African blood. She could be one fourth. Okay. So, and yes, that would include anyone. Never mind. I'm not going to even go through that explanation. So, but I see her as an Indian woman. She's mainly Indian. I'm part Irish, but I don't see myself as Irish. I wouldn't, you know, I'm part uh, Italian. I'm part native. I would, I don't see myself as a native man. I have native components. I have, you know, Italian parts, you know, Irish parts, but I, I'm a black man. You know what I'm saying? I'm an African, I'm African American man. You got what I'm saying? So I just, um, the jury's out with me, you know, on that. I see her as an Indian woman. So I, I just, you know, but just an interesting point. And as my first priority had and, and remains as a first priority to me, the safety of the American people. So that has not changed. And sadly, I think that there's a, a bit of misinformation, if not more than a bit. Um, but I'm glad that you raised the subject so that I can address it. You, but, but, I, but, but, but just if you don't mind, just let sure. me just finish. I, because I think the, 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 the spirit of your question is really important and I'm glad you raised it. Our country deserves to have a president of the United States who is not afraid of good ideas and does not stand on pride if a perspective needs to be informed by different points of view to build consensus. <sighs> And to have a common sense approach. I'm never going to shy away from good ideas. Tell me what started CNN down the road of being bad. I noticed that when I watched certain CNN broadcasts of something or news stories, people would really be flipping out about CNN like they're so bad. What started it? And by the way, Anderson's been quite difficult with her. And I assume that that would be maybe a way for them to gain more trust from the public now. Um, help me out with that, because I, I don't know their story of, oh, CNN is so bad. I, I just, you know, but everyone always tells me anyway that the majority of the news is left-leaning anyway. So a lot of people say that, you know, Hollywood or the news is nothing but an extension of each other. They're, they both work together in tandem. So and they're all, you know, Democrat. So I don't know. And I'm not going to feel the need to have pride associate with a position that I've taken when the important thing is to build consensus to fix problems. I believe in fixing problems. I love fixing problems. And so I pledge to you to you be do? a president <laughs> who not only works for all Americans, but works on getting stuff done. And that means compromise. And it doesn't mean compromising your values or your principles, but it does mean working to get stuff done. And but I pledge to you, I will do that. Just to be clear though, what he's referring to, and, and you point out too, when you're running for vice president in 2020, uh, you were not talking about banning fracking, but- No, no, I, no Anderson, I, I pledge that I would not ban fracking. Right, I know, you said yeah. you would not ban fracking. Uh, you know, you had said in a 2019 town hall, there's no question I'm in favor of banning fracking. In 2017, you talked about Medicare for all, you talked about uh, 2019 you raised a hand in debate about uh, if border, border crossing should be decriminalized. Are all of those issues, which are, those are not your positions now, are all those issues that you're saying through consensus and getting stuff done, you have evolved on? Well, no, let's take, for example, the issue of Medicare. My point has always been that access to health care should not just be a privilege of those who can afford it. It should be a right for all people. So that is why I have worked on doing what we have done to, one, allow Medicare to negotiate against the big pharmaceutical companies to bring down the cost of prescription medication. We've, uh, we've achieved that in terms of capping the cost of insulin for seniors at $35 a month, capping the cost of, of annual prescriptions at $2,000 a year for seniors. But my plan moving forward based on that very principle that I've always had is as president to have that cap be for everyone and not just for our seniors. The work that I have done that has been about recognizing the importance of dealing with border security, that has never changed. As I said, I have prosecuted transnational criminal organizations. That I did for years before I ever ran in 2019. I mean, you did raise your hand saying in a debate 
when asked if border crossing should be decriminalized, but obviously that is not your, your position. I, I never intended, nor do I, will I ever allow America to have a border that is not secure. I believe we need to deal with the illegal immigration. There needs to be consequences. Which Wait is a minute. I don't understand how she's saying we need to deal with illegal immigration if you've been busing in illegal immigrants. I don't get that. How does that make sense? Someone help me to understand because I feel like there's something I'm missing. Why part of my plan that I have outlined, and again, please go to KamalaHarris.com. Sorry to throw a website on you, but why not? Um, and you will see that part of my plan includes what we need to do to actually do more as it relates to putting resources in, including increasing penalties for illegal crossing. And just finally on fracking, you said you're clear you would not ban it as president. No, you, I would not ban it as president. Right, you're, under, you're clear on that. Do you think it is bad for the environment, though? I think that we have proven that we can invest in a clean energy economy. We can mitigate greenhouse gas emissions. We can work on a, and sustaining what we need to do to protect this beautiful earth of ours and not ban fracking. Tanisha Spall from Lansdowne, Pennsylvania. She works There's as the Education there. Administration Manager for the Pennsylvania Department of Corrections. Registered Democrat who said she's leaning towards supporting you has yet to make a final decision. Remind me of Ms. Jackson. Thank you, Thank you, Mr. President, for joining us this evening. I appreciate that you did acknowledge that we are a country that is faced with problems and issues. With the Supreme Court being plagued with issues, would you be in favor of expanding the court to say 12 so each justice has only one circuit court other than Chief Justice to assist in making judgments more balanced? Well, to your point, I, th there is no question that the American people increasingly are losing confidence in the Supreme Court, and in large part because of the behavior of certain members of that court and because of certain rulings, including the Dobbs decision and taking away a precedent that had been in place for 50 years, protecting a woman's right to make decisions about I was waiting for that. I was waiting so for I that. I was that waiting some for it. kind of reform of the court and... We can study what that actually looks like, but I do believe. But again, let's just, while you raise the point of the court, understand that, again, in 13 days, the American people will decide who is the next president of the United States. In 13 days, you will decide. I'm ready for this to be over so bad. 20th. And on one hand, you have in Donald Trump. Someone has, who has increasingly proved himself Donald Trump. to be unstable. Donald Trump. And who, as we unstable. have established, and the people close He's to him dangerous. have established, he is unfit to serve. Oh, God. Somebody who, on January 20th, you can be sure, will spend full time like we know and we've seen the image mentally of Same. him. Same. Stop. In tiny room off of the oh, my God. For hours, as people violently attack the Capitol. You can be sure because he has said he would weaponize the Department of Justice to go after his political enemies that you can look at a Donald Trump in the White House after January 20th sitting in that Oval Office plotting his revenge. He has talked about the enemies within. We haven't even raised that subject, Anderson. She we makes me wish, listening to her makes me wish I could vote Trump 10 times. Trump, 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 Trump. Oh my God. He's talking about the American people. He's no, he's not. No, he's not. He's about journalists, judges, nonpartisan election officials. He has talked about as John everyone here is the American people. <laughs> everyone here is the American people, except for the illegals. All right, every so everyone here that's legal is is American people, but there are going to be enemies within. And from what I understand, he's talking about yes, some of these journalists. The journalism. <laughs> but so what? <laughs> People do have enemies within their own organizations. I've talked about this before. Sometimes you got Republicans that are enemies within. They, they are Republicans that are against him and trying to smear him. All right? Kamala, she probably, she's got some people on the left that are against her, that are enemies within. Yes. They're American people, but they act like she talking like you talking about me and you sitting on the couch watching the news. Come on now. Kelly has talked about can he send the military <laughs> after peaceful protesters? How and many more minutes it is? Four minutes left. Plotting his revenge, plotting his retribution, I mean, creating an enemies list. I'm going to tell you my list 
will be a list of how I address and continue to address the issues that you all are raising this afternoon and evening. It will be a to-do list about how we can impact the American people and lift up the American people and address some of the challenges that we continue to face. I want to get one last questioner in. Uh, this is Elkin Pleat. He's a student at Temple University, registered Democrat, leaning towards voting for you, has yet to make up his final decision. Elkin. Hi. Uh, first of all, go birds. And uh, hi, from, I'm from Danville, California. Oh, hi, Elkin. But uh, my question is, what is the proudest moment of your political career thus far, including when you were the AG? Oh, that's a great one. I've actually had a few. Um, one of them um, is I, as Attorney General of California, created um, what I named the... Uh, well, actually making it up as you go along. <laughs> Bureau of Children's Justice. Well, and you may be familiar with that as a Californian. And it was, it was because I believe that, frankly, we still have a lot to do in terms of policy that impacts children. And an investment in the children. By the way, the uh, the actress who imitates her on Saturday Night Live is funny. And so she always calls him Joe Biden. <laughs> our country is an investment in all of us and our future. And that work has actually produced significant results. That has been a proud moment for me. It was a proud uh, moment for me to, um, to do the work that we've been doing that has addressed issues like maternal mortality. I mean, it's, it's in response to an incredible tragedy. But lifting up that issue in a way that we what more? agree that we've been doing that has addressed issues like maternal mortality. Uh, I mean, it's it's in response to an incredible tragedy. But lifting up that issue in a way that we agree that America should not have one of the highest maternal mortality rates in the world. So I, I have had the good fortune of... Shouldn't have one of the highest abortion rates in the world either. In my life as a public servant, knowing the impact that we can have. And I guess that is probably what um, motivates me most, because I know we can make a difference. I really do. And I do believe that the American people deserve a president who's going to be hardworking and, you know, will make mistakes from time to time. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> she did that. Look at him. In this election. Come this on, man. Fundamental. Uh, you deserve a president. I believe the American people deserve a president who's saying, look, let's just be practical. She does it a lot. Let's get things done. And let's not be afraid of having a little joy. <laughs> to the point of, you know, what gives you, what makes you feel good about your work. Let's, let's do it in a way that is grounded in optimism. You know, the thing that I think we all know about who we are as the American people, we are people who are ambitious. We have asked. I do not believe in any way, shape, or form that she could win this without there being something done. Okay. Aspirations, we have dreams. We are inherently optimistic. Inherently optimistic. And I, I think people are exhausted with the... Well, if we're so inherently optimistic, wouldn't an optimistic person say when they get pregnant that they're going to bring this baby into the world healthy and raise it to be a great human being. Wouldn't they use that great, optimistic, intimate human intuition to do that? Why would we somehow convince people that it's okay to snuff that life out? Optimism would say, hey, have that child. Raise them to be the best human being that you can. That child deserves to live. Is your body, you have your rights over your body, but that child has that rights over their body too. And they deserve to live. They have the right to live. Magnus for president, 2028, right? 2028. The idea that we're just gonna be divided and angry instead of working on the problems and working together. And um, that's what motivates me and that's what makes me proud when we're able to do that. Sorry. Vice President Kamala Harris, thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank, thank you. you. And thank thanks you. for watching. Thanks to all the voters. And here. thank sure God this is over. Oh, I ain't got nothing to say. I am done. I'm tired. I'm tired. 10 million subscribers. Whoa.